Continuing on with chapter 1.5, this is lesson number two. We're going to finish off our ionic nomenclature rules, uh, this time now for polyatomic ions and also the ionic hydrates. So, polyatomic ions, when we look at this one, they are made up of multiple, usually non-metallic uh, atoms that have been bonded together, but I don't know, the easiest way to kind of think about them is that they were trying to be molecular, but they somehow failed. And in this failure, they developed a new surplus charge. What's really interesting about these polyatomic ions is when they make these failures, the bond that they create within each, uh, to each other is really, really strong. And so what we find is in a lot of chemical reactions, these polyatomic ion groupings tend to survive the reaction intact. So we treat these guys here as single entities. Here, I'll just zoom in a little bit. All right, so you can see here's a big, ugly organic one called acetate. It's two carbons, three hydrogens, two oxygens, and all together these guys have a minus one charge. Uh, a really co uh, common one here is carbonate. All right, you can see a carbon bonded to three oxygens, and somehow we have this minus two charge. How and why we get these surplus charges doesn't matter for us in Chem 10, 20, or 30. We just have to re recognize that they are there. Some of them can be really ugly, like hydrogen oxalate. It's got a two-word name. Be very careful for this one. And so you can see a hydrogen, two oxygens, two carbons, two oxygens, and all together, this thing has a minus one charge. Um, you know, dihydrogen phosphate, another one that's got two names. And you can see two hydrogens with a phosphorus and four oxygens, all holding a minus one charge. Okay, so if you see something that looks a little bit bigger and uglier than just metal versus non-metal, that's kind of your key to look for that polyatomic ions chart. Once you've identified that you have a polyatomic ion, the me uh, mechanics of coming up with the formulas and coming up with the names is exactly the same as what we did earlier for the metals and non-metals. We will identify the cation, we'll identify the uh, an ion, we'll write out each ion symbol and charge, and then we will determine the LCM. Again, don't swap and drop, it's not helping you. If there's more than one polyatomic ion, however, you do have this big group of uh, uh, atoms behaving as a single ionic charge. We need to place brackets around that polyatomic ion symbol if we're going to need more than one, because if I double up a phosphate, for example, I'm doubling up the phosphorus and the three oxygens that have, or four oxygens that have the three minus total charge. So in that big grouping, I need to um, kind of highlight that that group is there, and we do so with brackets in chemistry. So again, this is best learned through our examples. Here we can take a look at lithium nitrate. You'll notice a slightly different suffix here. A lot of times uh, we can identify the polyatomic ions because they have A-T-E or I-T-E suffixes rather than the I-D-E suffix that we see for our nonmetals. So that can be one of the helpful hints that we use. Lithium is a plus one. Nitrate, when we go looking for that one, all right, this is in alphabetical order, we'll find the nitrate. Where to go? There it is. Nitrate right here is nitrogen, three oxygens, all with a one minus charge. So I write that out, and so I have this NO3 grouping, which carries a one minus charge. From there, I figure out the LCM, which in this example is not challenging. One and one should be one. Look for your neutral ratio. How many lithiums to get to a charge of one? Only one of them. How many nitrates to get to a charge of one? Hey, only one of them. And so now I can make my formula. So this would be Li, NO3, and again, remember, we don't write the number one too often in chemistry. How about ammonium phosphide? All right, so ammonium, we go looking for that one. It's in the cation position. They're always listed first, and as I go through here, I don't see anything that is ammonium. So when I don't find it there, I go looking up here, and there's your ammonium ion, which is NH4 with a one plus charge. Phosphide, that is our nonmetal of phosphorus in its ionic form, so it's P with a three minus charge. And so now I need to find the lowest common multiple between one and three, which would be three. And now I need to ask, how many ammoniums do I need to get to a total charge of three? 
If each one is just carrying one, it's going to take three ammoniums in this particular compound. And to get to three, it only takes one phosphide to do this. So I have a three to one ratio between cations and anions. Now, if I write this one out, I have NH4, three, and then P. Looks pretty ugly, doesn't it? Well, so in this case, I need the brackets to identify that it's three NH4 groups that I have in this particular compound, not 43 hydrogens. So if I have multiples of a polyatomic ion, in this case, NH4, and I want to show that I have three of them, that kind of cleans up the formula a little bit and clearly shows that I have three ammoniums for every one phosphide in this compound. We can take a look at beryllium oxalate. Here's BE. It's a 2+. plus Oxalate, when you find that one on, the pure, uh, on your polyatomic ions chart, is OOCCOO with a 2- minus charge. Yeah, big ugly one there. And so, take a look at your LCM here. Between 2 and 2, it must be 2. And so what neutral ratio do I need here? All right, it's just a 1 to 1 ratio. 1 beryllium to get to a charge of 2, 1 oxalate to get to a charge of 2. So it gives me my 1 to 1 ratio. And so 1 beryllium and then 1 oxalate. No brackets are necessary here because I only need one of the big ugly polyatomic ion. I'll do one more for you and then I'll let you guys finish the other three. Here you can see that we have <clears throat> multivalent copper. And so we're shown that one plus charge. Carbonate, all right, there's another one of those ones that has the unique suffix to help let you know that it's a polyatomic ion. And so carbonate is CO3 with a two minus charge. So I have a one and a two. The lowest common multiple between that is gonna be two which means I'm going to need two copper cations to balance out just one carbonate anion. That gives me my subscripts, and so I have Cu2, CO3, and again, no bracket necessary here because I only have one of the polyatomic ion. Okay, so try this out, pause the video, finish the other three, and then we'll take a look at those solutions uh, when you're ready to restart. Here's your three remaining solutions. Fe3 bracket BO3 bracket 2 because it's going to take multiple borates to come up with that neutral ratio. So the brackets become necessary in that example. Brackets are also necessary in iron 3 acetate. Acetate being a 1 minus charge, it's going to take three of them to balance out the one iron 3 plus. And so you get that as your formula. And then we have one here with two polyatomic ions in it. The polyatomic cation of ammonium sulfate as the polyatomic anion. The LCM is two, which gives us a two to one neutral ratio. And so brackets are necessary on the ammonium part to show that you have two NH4 groups in this ionic crystal. Okay, again, hoping that all made sense. To be able to name these polyatomic ion compounds, it's the same kind of stuff that we did with monovalent and multivalent. If there's only one cation choice, no detective work is necessary and you just name things as is. If, however, you do have multiple choices for your cation, then you'll have to do a little bit of detective work to figure out which Roman numeral for the cation needs to go into the name. So here we have this and you can see all sorts of letters here. Remember that all of these uh, ionic compounds that we do are binary, which means there's a positive cation part and a negative anion part. We never have three or four part ionic compounds. So even though you might see a whole bunch of letters, some of this has to be the positive part and the other ha part has to be the negative. And so I see the NH4 here for ammonium. All right, we generally don't lead out with nonmetals anyway. Okay, and so there's the NH4 with a one plus charge. That means the remaining part here of chloride is the anion. Okay, so we had a lot of letters there, but it's really still just a positive cation and a negative anion. Because there's only one choice for the cation, no detective work is necessary, and we just write it as is. So this becomes ammonium chloride. Here in the next one, you can see a whole bunch of stuff going on here. 
I see calcium on the lead. Remember, cations are written first, and so calcium is just a single 2 plus uh, cation. And then I have this MnO4, which is permanganate. And when we take a look at uh, permanganate here, we can see that it just has that 1 minus charge. And so no detective work is necessary here again. We just write it as is, and so this is calcium permanganate. All right, and so for the spelling help on those polyatomics, remember it's all clearly spelled out for you in the periodic table. Just make sure that you're taking the time with it. All right, here we see TI, bracket SCN3. When we look at TI, we can see that it is multivalent. So there is going to be some detective work here. I should take a look and see what SCN is. All right, that one is thiocyanate, and it has a 1 minus charge. So when I take a look at my SCN with that 1 minus charge, there's only, uh, oh, pardon me, there's three of them in this particular compound. And so that gives me a total negative charge of minus 3 for the neutral ionic crystal. There's only one titanium to balance this, so there's one cation here. So that means that we have a plus 3 version of titanium needed to balance this out. So the plus 3 here relates to this. And so there are multiple versions of titanium thiocyanate. This particular one is titanium 3 thiocyanate. All right, making some sense, seeming really familiar. I hope it is. Pause the video again, please, and try the next four. See if you can come up with the correct name with or without those uh, Roman numerals as necessary. Okay, good luck. Here's your solutions. All right, so we had four more to do. Hopefully your answers match. Ammonium selenide, aluminum phosphate, ammonium acetate, and gold 1-hydrogen oxalate. Uh, a good one to highlight there is the last one. You had to do some detective work to figure out which gold was actually involved. You had to include the Roman numeral. And we saw one of the first ones here that had a two-word name for the polyatomic ion. So, again, we do see things like this big, ugly, nasty set of letters here. It's only two parts, cation and anion. And we can also see three words in the name, but it's still only two parts, gold one, and then the hydrogen uh, oxalate. So hopefully that went well for you. At this point, I would again pause the video, and I would work on Ionic Worksheet 1, which is on the next page. Okay, so try to complete some of that one. You've got some formulas to come up with. <clears throat> You've got some names to come up with. Get that work done, and uh, we'll review that. Uh, later on. One last thing to do with you guys here today is writing and naming the ionic hydrates. Now these guys are just a you know another type of ionic compound but the word hydrate in here lets us know that we are dealing with uh, something that inclo includes a little bit of water. And so uh, the definition of these ionic hydrates is to say that they decompose at fairly low temperatures and will always produce the ionic compound and some quantity of water. So the ionic compound component of these is named the exact same way for everything we've done so far. All we're doing is putting an addition onto the name to describe the amount of embedded water. And that's all we're really doing here. So we can take a look at here, CuSO4 and we see that there are five waters within this. So you can see that you have copper. You can see that you have sulfate. Sulfate being a two minus charge with only one copper to balance must be copper two. And so I get copper two sulfate here, but it also has five waters. And so we name the ionic compound as is, copper two sulfate, and then we put a dash and write the word water. And then what we do is we put the ratio or the fraction of ionic crystals to water molecules in the brackets following it. You could also use Greek prefixes. This is also another way that we see it. So copper 2 sulfate, and then you just describe how many water molecules with this hydrate uh, name. And so the Greek prefix for 5 is penta. You can choose either way to do this. 
Most of us will do the water and the ratio, but this is still fairly common as well. So the amount of water that we have in these hydrates cannot be predicted, so this information would always have to be provided. If we take a look at this first one here, you can see BACL2. BA is a 2 plus ion. CL is a 1 minus ion. No detective work is necessary because there's only one choice. So the ionic portion here is just to say barium chloride. And then we have to put the dash, write the word water, and now tell me the fraction of barium chlorides to water. You can see it's one part barium chloride to two parts water, so we would just say water one half. Going the other way here, copper two sulfate, so I do know that I have the copper two plus ion. All right, sulfate is SO4 two minus. We should figure out what that neutral ratio is, and so there's your LCM, which is equal to two, and you get a one to one ratio. So that means for my formula, it's just CuSO4. No dash this time, it's a dot in the molecular, or in the, um, pardon me, the hydrate formula. And then we just have to resolve how many waters were here. Remember, this is the copper two sulfate, this is the water, so for every one copper two sulfate, we have five waters. See, not too hard, hydrates are easy. Uh, for the next one here, all right, we'll go back the other way. Here's uh, Mg2 plus for magnesium. Sulfate is still SO4 with a two minus. No rough work necessary because it's a univalent metal. And so this is just magnesium sulfate. And then so I'll put that dash and I'll just write the word water and we put in that ratio. One part magnesium sulfate to seven parts water, and so this is magne oops, magnesium sulfate, one seventh. Okay, uh, I'll do one more for you, then I'll let you guys practice this just a little bit here. Here I can see strontium nitrate, so strontium is SR with a two plus. Nitrate is NO3 with a one minus. Because I'm going back to the formula here, I should do my LCM, which is two and find my neutral ratio. It just takes one strontium for every two nitrates. And so this becomes SR bracket NO3 bracket two. Put in the dot, and then we need to figure out how many water molecules here. You'll notice I've gone to the Greek naming, and so tetra is the Greek prefix for four, and so you have four waters in this one. Okay, try the other three. Pause the video and I'll put up those answers here shortly for you when you restart the video. So your answers to this one then would be lithium chloride, water, one to one. For your formula, for sodium carbonate decahydrate would be Na2CO3 dot 10 waters, or 10 H2O. And then finally for MgCl, uh, six waters here. All right, no rough work is necessary. It's just magnesium chloride, and then we get water one-sixth. Okay, so you'll see these from time to time. Uh, we especially have them in the lab at times, and so make sure that you are able to recognize them and deal with them. If we were weighing these out, as we'll see in Chapter 2, with these waters, I can't discount the weight of them when I start doing things like molar mass, and so we do have to uh, quantify or account for the ones that are there. All right, so that finishes off for us our ionic nomenclature uh, review. So things that you want to do just to practice this, all right, uh, the language of chemistry must be well known if we're going to do well in Chemistry 20. The Chem 10 stuff has to be understood and uh, proficient as we go forward, okay? And I hate to see Chemistry 10 getting in the way of student success in Chemistry 20. So do sufficient practice to make sure that this is going well for you. Uh, page 32 in the textbook has a couple of questions, and then the next page of your notes has ionic worksheet number two, which includes some hydrates. So try to do these, coming up with the names and the formulas respectively. I don't have any room here for the rough work, so do that in the margins or on a separate sheet of paper as you're trying it. And uh, yeah, good luck with that, guys.